Hey, I hope everybody had a great Halloween. It's another episode of the Nuclear Pod Blast, the official podcast for Nuclear Blast Records. I'm your host of Metal Scaramonies, Andrew Sample. Yeah, sorry, that was lame. As usual, damned glad to be here, bringing you everything in the world of Nuclear Blast. It's been a few months since the last episode, but we've been busy, and we've got three feature interviews on this episode coming up. Before we get into that, though, some uh, label news. If you haven't heard, Danish hardcore standouts Cabal have signed a worldwide deal with Nuclear Blast, as well as Swedish high-energy rock and roll gods The Helicopters. Also signed a worldwide deal with Nuclear Blast. They'll have a new record out in 2022. Get excited about that. Also just announced, Nuclear Blast have re-signed Municipal Waste. And Ryan Waste was quoted as saying, We couldn't think of a more suitable place for the waste than our radioactive family at Nuclear Blast. They've always given us complete creative freedom and challenged us to push it to the limit with our deranged ideas. As the music business changes with the times, we trust that our vision remains unfazed by trends and our label backs us up with full force, end quote. So that's great news for all three bands. As always, go to NuclearBlastUSA.com for the latest label news, as well as new releases. We'll talk about a bunch of those releases throughout the episode, as well as some vinyl bundles, pre-orders, a couple of November releases to take note of. The brand new Hypocrisy record, Worship, comes out November 26th, as well as the Epica album, Omega Live, and the live Suffocation album, Live in North America, out November 12th. Speaking of hypocrisy, we will have Peter Tatgren on the next episode of the Nuclear Pod Blast, so look forward to that, along with Ben from Chemist. Uh, The Chemist guys have a new record as well. Deceiver comes out November 19th, Denver Doom at its finest. The three interviews lined up for this episode include Stefan from Obscura, Steve Zetro Souza from the one and only Exodus, as well as Dennis from Ghost Bath. So three great bands, three totally different bands, Before we get into the interview with Dennis from Ghost Bath, a couple of brand new cuts from Nuclear Blast for you. Brand new Cradle of Filth, The Existence is Feudal record just came out October 22nd. This is Necromantic Fantasies, and welcome back to the Nuclear Pod Blast.
This is the Nuclear Pod Blast. Almost morning. What a great way to stay creative during lockdown. The Sepulchorta Project, featuring so many killer guest musicians, including Devin Townsend on that track right there. Mask, Sepultura, here on the Nuclear Pod Blast with Andrew Sample. Thanks again for tuning in. 
Brand new Cradle of Filth before that, Necromantic Fantasies. The Existence is Feudal record just came out October 22nd. If you're a big fan of Cradle of Filth, you might want to consider the Existence is Feudal box set that's available at the Nuclear Blast store at nuclearblastusa.com. Not only is the album available on double black vinyl, cassette, as well as both digipack and regular CD versions, but again, this box set, which is limited to 1,650 copies worldwide, contains the digipack CD, the double vinyl available in gold or silver, some buttons, a flag, a necklace, and a lyric sheet, again, limited to 1,650, and you can get that for just over 80 bucks US, again, at nuclearblastusa.com, the web store. Also, uh, over there, the Fear Factory Aggression Continuum Blue-White Splatter Double Vinyl just came in for 30 bucks US. You can get the new Massacre album Resurgence on double black vinyl, as well as double Cena Mustard Swirl. What? I don't know. Sounds awesome, though. The upcoming Hypocrisy album Worship is available on blue, black, white vinyl, black, red, marbled vinyl, as well as a glow-in-the-dark vinyl version coming January 21st. Those are available for pre-order now. Also, the new releases from Epica and Battle Beast are available for pre-order now, again at NuclearBlastUSA.com. Ghost Bath, um, a band I truly, honestly ignored. Probably their first two albums. And regretfully so, after finally visiting some of the later material and digging further back, there's a lot going on with this band. And I was happy to talk to Dennis, who's the mastermind behind Ghost Bath, for all of their records. The Self-Loather album just came out, and it was good to talk to Dennis and get his input on uh, what's going on in that mind of his and, uh, and how he feels his band has progressed over the course of this pandemic. So enjoy the interview. Back with the Nuclear Pod Blast, Dennis McCoola from Ghost Bath. Big pleasure to have you on the program, man, and congratulations on your upcoming record, Self-Loather, coming out the 29th of this month, just in time for Halloween. Hey, thanks for having me on. You're, of course, vocalist, guitarist, uh, this is piano synthesizer's main visionary of the band. Self-Loather is the final album in the series that began with uh, the Moon Lover album, with Storm Mourner being the middle piece. Uh, before we talk about the music on Self-Loather, can you recap and explain the vision and, and evolution of the three albums, uh, the three album cycle, so to speak? Sure. Um, after I'd put out Funeral, which was the the first uh, full-length album I wrote, and I just did by myself um, on my computer with, you know, not in a studio. Uh, I came up with the idea of doing sort of a three-album trilogy when I when I started going um, to do it fully in a studio. The idea came from a, a painter that I really like called Mark Rothko. Um, he does giant canvases of, uh, you know, blocks of color. It's super abstract art, but it would be like, you know, an eight foot tall canvas um, of like black and blue and gray. And when he was asked, you know, what do you paint? He said, I just try to capture the three basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy and doom. And so I use that kind of as a roadmap for for the three albums. So Moon Lover was tragedy. Um, Star Mourner was ecstasy and then self-loather this one's doom not as in the genre of doom but but a feeling of doom and and dread and so um i had them all planned out from the beginning and and so this one was was going to be the the heaviest um the the darkest record and it also happened to be the the first record that we actually wrote as an entire band instead of just me uh writing all the music myself that's great. And with Self-Loather, like you said, being the darkest and the heaviest of those three, it's also the most varied musically and vocally. Uh, in the new release bio, it says that you had the vision for this final album since the start of the process, if I read that right. Yeah. So, yeah, I had the entire uh, roadmap set out. I wanted to do three. I think I think the idea for a trilogy came um, from my love for for like fantasy novels. A lot of them will do do sort of a trilogy. You know, you got the the first part, the middle book and then, you know, the final book. And so I, I really like that format and it, it gave me um, something to look forward to with each album. And it kind of just set the entire theme and atmosphere beforehand and then i could just explore that theme um as we wrote each one cool man well the album opener track and first single convince me to bleed 
uh, delivers such a, s- a sensory overload of pummeling, you know, guitars, synthesizers, and vocals at the same time. The song almost gives a, a false sense of what to expect for the rest of the record, since there's such a wide range of styles and emotions present. Yeah, the, uh, "Convince Me to Bleed" was the the first song we wrote for the record, um, and it was one of the the songs that we all wrote in the same room and and just jammed it and figured it out together. Um, because of the pandemic and because I lived about an eight hour drive away in North Dakota and the rest of the guys lived in Minneapolis, um, we, we used a bunch of different styles and methods to write the songs and, and we have three different guitar players. And so some of the songs, you know, have a, have a beginning riff or idea by me and then other ones have them by the other two guitar players. And so those kind of give a, a varying feel to all the different tracks. That's sort of what I wanted. I didn't, um necessarily want you know every single ghost bath album to just have solely my voice and so i think this this allowed it to be more varied and and more of a journey as you listen through well hide from the sun plays out like a bleak horror film over the course of five and a half minutes i really dig it how does a song like that with such a roller coaster ride uh come together that song was one of the ones that i wrote mostly myself um that's more of my style of writing um it comes from more of a depressive black metal background um that's that's kind of the original int- intention of the band even though it's kind of expanded beyond that genre um when i write something like that it, it's usually just me alone sort of overnight my guitar and my computer and i i just begin with with the starting riff the very first riff you hear in the song the clean picking part and then i just layer on and layer on and and continue through the song until i have something i like with the woman screaming over that early part too, that are sets up, sets up the song pretty, pretty. Uh, it's pretty haunting, actually. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I've d- I've done that before, and I think you know samples are are also uh, kind of a staple in in DSBM, and so yeah, it just made sense to put that in there, and I kind of made it a little bit um, uncomfortable to listen to because I, I I play it for so long at the beginning of the track, but I I like to to get people out of their comfort zone, so. Gotcha. Uh, Sinew and Vain may be one of my favorite tracks so far. It just pours a mountain of darkness onto the listener in a plodding way, like at the beginning, uh, only to have the pace increased and the intensity turned up with the layering of the death and the shrieking vocals. Uh, the song seems to never stop evolving, actually, until it gets to the end. That is the only track on the record that we wrote in the studio um, on the spot. You know, we we, exper- we really experimented with with different ways of writing for this record and and that one all we had was the very again the very first guitar you hear that picking part and from there um we just you know talked it out and and we got the drums done first actually with with just the guitar kind of playing along to figure things out and yeah i think that one turned out turned out pretty good um it kind of has a mix of some of our old background in um like post hardcore type feel for some of the parts but i think both the vocals and and the drum style kind of tear it away from that but it's it's a really cool mix yeah i dig that song a lot well you claim to have reached the peak of your vision uh for the band's sound and delivery with self-loather not to get ahead of ourselves but with that kind of statement uh, how does a band like ghost bath look to grow after this it, it sort of leaves things open for us um we can go in in a lot of different directions and this will be the first album um, that we're writing where we don't have a preconceived plan at all. And uh, I think I really liked the the idea of all of us writing it together instead of just me. So we're going to keep to that. And we've so far just been throwing around some ideas and trying to figure out which way we want to go. I definitely, I definitely don't want it to sound like anything before, but I think, you know, if I'm writing the parts and they're writing the parts, it's still going to sound like Ghost Bath. It's just a matter of where we want to take it. And so right now, it's just kind of a an open thing where we're we're going to figure out what we're we're passionate about, figure out what sounds good, and and we'll come up with something brand new. Cool. Well, hailing from such an already secluded area uh, in North Dakota, I'm wondering how the pandemic played into your day to day existence while also delivering a backdrop uh, to the crafting of this new album. Uh, yeah, I think I I had a much different experience than than most people did with the pandemic, just because it was such a small area. 
you know, we didn't really have any kind of lockdown or travel restrictions or anything like that that I've been getting asked about in other interviews from other countries, especially. You know, for me, I, I mostly stay at home anyway. And I think it just it didn't affect me as much at, at the beginning and during the height of it um, than it did for other people. Um, but now now it's sort of um, having this lingering effect where, you know, it's really hard for us to get on a tour. It's really hard um, for us to get on festivals just because everything is getting pushed ahead from this year and last year that that got canceled. Um, as far as the recording process, you know, it was it just it just drew it out longer. And so I would have to wait a little bit longer to drive out there for a few days at a time. And, you know, we weren't in a rush. We, we knew, like, you know, if we can't put it out in the middle of. 2020 there's no point in doing that so we just took our time with the record and and you know adapted well listen man i appreciate you taking the time for the for the pod blast congratulations on the new album again out the 29th of october and uh look forward to seeing hopefully you guys on the road soon hey that would be great i'd love to play soon and thanks for having me on Ghost Bath from the Self Loather album just came out October 29th in time for Halloween. Great to talk to Dennis from the band, their first time on the Nuclear Pod Blast. This is Andrew. Appreciate you listening. 
the always entertaining Steve Zetro Souza coming up. A uh, great feature interview with him about the new album, the new Exodus record, Persona Non Grata, out November 19th. That's just around the corner, man. Before the interview, let's do the first song you heard from the new record, The Beatings Will Continue Until Morale Improves. It's the Nuclear Pod Blast. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Andrew back with the Nuclear Pod Blast, and we're a ways away from street date for the new Exodus record, Persona Non Grata, uh, but uh, super stoked to talk with Zet. He's part of the program here on the Nuclear Pod Blast today. Hey, man, it's uh, it's the start of Labor Day weekend. We're well ahead of release, uh, and I know you've got family, so I appreciate you taking the time for the Nuclear Pod Blast. No problem. Got to got to do this as part of it. You know what I mean? This is like the goes hand in hand. If you do the record, you got to do this part of it. Come on. Especially if the singer, the bass player and the drummer and maybe the rhythm guitar player gets away with that. But me and Gary, you know, we're full up. As you should be. Again, November 19th for the release, so we're, we're a long ways away. Hell, we've got, we've got Halloween to get through before that, so. It's been seven years, so if you really were to take that time, it's actually no time at all. So when you're this close, I mean, to, especially to us, I mean, we're, we're, I mean, it's released as far as I'm concerned. You even got a song <laughs> already, so. It's, exactly. It's, it's out. You guys are coming off a killer in what looked to be a super fun performance at Psycho Las Vegas uh, with John Tempesta sitting in for Tom Hunting. Tell us about that. Had to be a little nerve wracking going into that show. Tom's great. Uh, Tom is, um, you know, he had he had to have eight total uh, chemo, uh, and he has four left. He had uh, surgery. Was all good. I, I he says he he's cancer free, but he doesn't want to say it yet. So um, he's still he's getting strong now, basically. So he he thought his initial take was if I'm walking, I'm drumming, but I don't think that you know. And and uh, 
I really don't think he knew what was going into this, you know, into his surgery and into the treatments and stuff. So he was like, "We, I do not want you to cancel. So, you know, why don't you, we just call Johnny. I mean, Johnny played on impact and yep. forced to have it. So um, it'll be great to go back and do, you know, an old school type set, you know, and play some songs. And we actually brought Rick with us, Rick got, Unol. I know you got the, the got the H team back together. We had the H team back for five songs on stage. So it was, it was great. You know, we've always been that way. You know, it was never like, I always sang Paul's songs. Rob always sings my songs. I always, I sing Rob's songs today. It's never a part of the Exodus history that's never not looked at, you know, or not, um, not celebrated in any way, shape or form. So it was great to get together with them. Of course, did I miss Tom? Yeah, I love Tom is Exodus, like Gary's Exodus, like Zed is Exodus. It's, it's, you know, Tom is, is full on, you know, you know what you get with that guy. <laughs> and, and, and I, I was just excited to play a show again because I'm not one of those types of guys that, um, there's my pugs. I'm not one of those types of guys that like gets nervous. I never get nervous ever. I mean, if there's eight people there or 80,000, I don't give a shit. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, bring it on. We all know one thing, November 19th, that album drops after seven years. And, um, you've heard it, <laughs> you know, I've heard it. It's, it's, I would say it's worth the wait. I guess if you had to look at something that long, it's definitely worth the wait. Absolutely. Well, the buildup to the album has been pretty fun, too, with Tom moving into the new home where he built the studio in which he and Gary started writing the ideas for the album. Um, I wanted to ask or how you personally approached uh, this album, maybe versus Blood In, Blood Out or anything in the past with the band, once you got uh, the complete set of songs. I mean, before that even happened, it's like, I remember last summer because um, to this week, like a year since like I went up to Lake Alvin or to Tom's house to start the process. And so it's been like a year and, and um, I, I didn't write, I wrote like two songs lyrically. Gary wrote pretty much everything else uh, musically other than slipping into madness. I wrote that song lyrically and Lee wrote the music, everything else. Gary had his hand in at least something. And I wrote the music uh, lyrics for elitist, but every other song, um, was Holt. And so it's like, um, it was just a great process to go up there with us five, no distractions. We stayed in a house. He had the studio was built in kind of his like huge ass three garage man cave thing. That's just awesome. And, um, we had the time to just take our time and go in there and not be rushed or not have to worry about another band coming in or not have to, you know, worry about what time we have to record or, you have to be in the studio tomorrow at this time. It did, you know, we, we were, we worked how, how it worked and everybody worked with each other. So it, it, it was probably the, you know, the most relaxing process so far ever. It's great to hear that. Um, let's um, start going through the songs, I guess. Uh, just the title track up front, a brutal opener, blistering tempo from the start, big vocals all around, and no less than seven and a half minutes. There has to be at least four different tempo changes and plenty of riff changes throughout. What an opening track, man. I know. I think it's nine minutes and five verses. And yeah, <laughs> I was like, he wrote this. I'm like, like, is he out of his fucking mind? We have to open with this. Normally, you open with the first song on the record when you put a record out. Sure. And I'm like, everybody in the be backstage warming up them hands. This is one you're going to open with. That opening fucking guitar riff itself is just... I, mean, I just look at their hands, do it. It makes me tired. You know what I mean? Sure, so sure. it's like fucking... I, I, and that, it's just a blister. I know. So I, I, I'm i with you on that. I, and the whole record is... I mean, the hills and valleys is just, you know, it's relentless. This is a relentless record, period. Not nice album. Uh, yeah, not nice at all. <laughs> the next track, uh, REMF, Rear Echelon Motherfuckers. Possibly a yeah. more standard, maybe Bay Area thrash song, you know. But again, as you noted in an interview recently that I read, an over-the-top, brutal vocal performance. Give us a little more insight on the track lyrically. Lyrically, the Rear Echelon Motherfuckers is about like all the captains and the lieutenants that are always pointing the fingers and telling the guys in the front to go get killed. You know what I mean? And that's what it's about. It's like, you fucking, you're the ones that always make the dumbass mistakes. 
you know, and you don't pay any consequence for it. So those, they are the rear echelon motherfuckers, you know? And so, uh, vocally I was listening to like Lamb of God and Behemoth last <laughs> summer. If you listen to the, I'm doing a shitload of stuff on this album that I never did before. I know, you know, so Gary and I had a talk probably last July. I mean, over a year ago, and he's set. I really want you to step it up on this record. And he goes, but I want you to be you, but I want you to be different, but not too different, but be you, but don't be you, but just be a little different. It's like, <laughs> I was like, ah, okay. And I go, but I've been listening to this type of book. He's so good. That's a good start. So I, I kind of incorporated, I mean, there's a part on there where I think I'm Jamie Josta. There's a part on there where I think I'm fucking Chuck Billy. You know what I mean? It's just like, I just like, incorporated but then there's parts on me where it's just me and then there's parts on there where i think i'm udo dirk schneider and there's parts <laughs> on there where i think i'm bon scott you know so i just was like the vocal uh, approach at it was just how i heard the music kind of and then again gary wrote a you know a, a great deal of the lyrics you know 80 percent or better and 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 uh, you know we work together when i'm recording is like you know like this and like i said after a month or two of me having the record done and tracks done, I would get the call going, so, yo, elitist, what do you think about this part? I'm like, oh, I think I could do it better. I think if I did this, he's on good. I'm glad you said that. So check it out. Go back in the studio and we'll do it like this and see what happens. And there was a couple of cases where we're like, oh my God, that's all so much better. Let's keep that. And there was a couple of cases where we're like, yeah, we'll just keep the original one, but we tried it. You know what I mean? So it was, we had time, you know, vocally, I think it's probably my most dynamic performance on anything from Tenet, Dublin, Death Patrol, Hatriot, Exodus, whatever, you know, that I I've done. So yeah. it all seemed to work. Once the final product came out, it worked. Absolutely. Like I said, it's noticeable. So kudos to you, man, for, for taking a chance and, Thank and you. having it come through, really. And you mentioned uh, sl Slipping Into Madness, which Lee wrote the music for and you wrote the lyrics. Super cool uh, guitar trade-offs happening up front while the drums build into the main tempo. Um, then all of a sudden we explode into more thrash madness. The, the lyrics I, I kind of pulled from there, the cocktails, the doctors, the pharmacists, the death tolls, the red room, uh, I, I think I see where this one's going. It's it, it's it's pretty much um, a metaphor for the fentanyl epidemic. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like you know, and the, and and um, the, the doctors are renaming the drug. So what they've done is they've found synthetic uh, uh, that's the same exact thing, and they're re-prescribing it. And and the pharmacists are giving it to people, and people are dying from this stuff. It's you know, and fentanyl's a drug you should only get if you're like in hospice and you're ready to die and they're been and and the cartels are putting it in cocaine and heroin now so two milligrams will kill you i mean it's i mean a grain of salt of this shit will kill you so it's just like you know, back in our day you can just do a blast of blow yeah. and it's fucking cocaine <laughs> now you don't know what they're up with you know what i mean you stick it in your face it could be the last thing you did so Absolutely. You know, you just never know. So I, I, that's kind of where that whole thing um, came about. You know, we used to be able to just do drugs. Now we got to fucking watch. And we always knew that heroin was the killer. Yep. If you knew drugs and you were a party, you're like, because we come from the 80s, man. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll and in that fucking order. You know, and it was like, you know, a good show was totally like, dude, is it a killer show tonight? I don't know. Is there broads backstage with a bunch of blow? <laughs> then that show's killer. You know, now it's like all about performance. But then it was like, if the performance was good, there was girls backstage, tons of booze and blow. It was great. Now you got, we would all have heart attacks. We're all fucking old men. You know what I mean? So I, that was pretty much written about that. You know, everybody's got their hand in it because everybody, typical corruption, taking a kickback for it. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't do drugs these days anymore, ever, anywhere. But now, fuck, if you're at a party and somebody gives you a key of Coke, it's fucking cut with fentanyl. It could be the last thing you ever put in your fucking face, you know? My favorite track, Prescribing Horror. Wow. Haunting riffs. You're the uh, second the, one today. Really? The second one today that said, too. Yeah, out of the five interviews, your second one today said their favorite track. And that's been my favorite track since the beginning. And it usually changes. And on this record, it has not. Well, man, it's got That's such a weird uh, haunting aura up front that builds into a, a great, uh, that slow, stomping verse tempo. The, the, the song is about sarin gas and thalidomide and how they used to use that in, in, in death camps, That's you know, right. as experimental drugs. 
and then that's how how babies were born with a fucking fetus coming off the side of their head and you know and that's so basically that's what the song is about and 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 you know like prescribing horror and um gary wrote that whole song the lyrics and everything to me my favorite from the the total richie blackmore fucking uh haunting lead in the middle to just the feel of the song quite possibly the slowest exodus song quite possibly the heaviest exodus song ever my favorite that one and lunatic liar lord those are my two favorites on on the record if i'm to listen to my album those are the two i love the most before uh before getting the new record earlier this week i, I listened to blood in blood out and it's crazy because i remember when that album came out and we talked you know we were talking about how strong that record was and how great of a reception it was getting but you know i think the band has actually outdone that record in terms of song variety and cohesion <laughs> Upon the first listen, I was reminded of the Tempo of the Damned record from 2004, which was kind of your comeback record. But I think that's still a great uh, testament in the band's catalog. But uh, how would you compare this record to any other Exodus record? This is, um, to me, this is, and I said this after Blood In, Blood Out, because I was like, I love this record. And I don't know how we're going to top this, but we did. And this is the best Exodus album, period. This one is. I know people will say Bond is, some will say Tempo. Right. But this one has everything. If I was to compare this record, I'd say it has all the old school elements with Tempo of the Dam meets Exhibit B. And that's how I look at this record. Because I think that Exodus, went during Rob's era, they really got brutal. The brutality that Gary wrote about, the riffs are brutal. But the, 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 Absolutely. The, the lead thought very abrasive. And I think that Blood and Blood Out had a little bit of that, but not as much as this one does. So when if even when I we got done with it and I couldn't talk about it, and people would say, Well, what do you think of the record? And my friends, I would say, if I was to compare this album, I would say this album is an old school sounding Temple of the Dam meets Exhibit B. And that's where because the music the compositions are like Exhibit B, but the songs are very, very abrasive. Like they're very shroud of urine-ish, you know uh, what I mean, off yes. tempo. But if you listen to um, the beatings, that that's kicking your face and rape and murder your wife all the way back <laughs> to the beginning. You know what I mean? We're back to tongue in cheek, and we're beating your ass again, and we're having the greatest time doing it. So ha ha ha. You know what I mean? So uh, before I let you go, man, your podcast, The Toxic Vault, really taking off. You're having a lot of fun with that. It's it's just awesome. That's fun just to do. And I think because there's so many little stories out there, you know, you don't can't get all the big stories and people do want, I mean, the real fans want to hear the little stories. So I try to get that. I try to get all the guys that were relevant here or relevant in other, some type, whatever. I mean, I've had a fireman on, I've had a chick who makes soaps with horror images. You know, I had a guy who makes cakes of anything you want and the whole fucking thing's edible. I had a guy who makes toys come in. I mean, I have different things, but the meat, the bread and butter is definitely, you know, the interviews I get. I've had uh, Waddy on. I've had the guys from Rancid, obviously Chuck, Eric, you know, and and, 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 and different guys from the Bay Area, the Forbidden guys, the Violence guys. So it's cool to just get their perspective and not be on a time limit because my show goes for however long as it takes to tell the story. It all works, you know. It all works to, hand in hand with Exodus, with you know, with that bat that I'm doing and all the other things that I do. So it all works hand in hand. Persona non grata, November 19th. Zet, thanks, man. I appreciate you taking the time for the nuclear pod blast. Now, I only think it's uh, fitting that uh, you have me on the uh, the toxic vault sometime. We have to do those live, though. We don't do them uh, over <laughs> the phone or on Skype. You have to come to the Bay Area to come to the That's what to I'm saying. Vault. That's what I'm saying. When I'm out there, I'm going to hit you up I'm when, I'm, when I come out there next time. Oh, I would love to have <laughs> you definitely. I'd make a full episode out of it. Are you kidding me? You're well. You let me know. Appreciate yes, it. Take the time again. Can't wait for the new record to be released and you guys get your asses back on the road. I'm telling you, me too. We're both in the same boat. I will see you soon. Thanks, my friend.
Big thanks to Zet from Exodus for joining the Nuclear Pod Blast again. Always, uh, always a pleasure to interview him. He's such a such a character. That was clickbait from the new Exodus record, Persona Non Grata, out November nineteenth. And speaking of Bay Area thrash, Death Angels, the Bastard Tracks, will be coming out on November twenty sixth this year. That was a set recorded live at the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco on May twenty second earlier this year, and streamed live soon after. The Bastard Tracks is a deep cuts collection of rarely and never performed songs from the band's celebrated catalog. I actually paid for that stream soon after it was recorded, and it's a killer performance. I uh, can't wait to get a physical copy myself. Also, just in time for the holidays, In Flames, the band's catalog from 1994 to 2008 will be reissued on CD via Nuclear Blast Records. Now, those are the albums, Lunar Strain, all the way through A Sense of Purpose, as well as the two live albums, The Tokyo Showdown from 2001 and Used and Abused from 2005. Coming up, it's our interview with Stefan from Obscura. You know, once every several years, there's a band who makes you rethink a genre or metal in general. And Obscura were one of those bands for thousands of death metal fans around the world. Stefan Kumero is an insanely talented musician and visionary, but my interview with Stefan coming up real soon. But before that, speaking of legendary death metal, Florida Legends Massacre are back. Returning to the fold are vocalist Cam Lee and original bassist Mike Borders. Cam Lee was quoted as saying, I feel it's the best it's been in years. Finally working with members in a team that are all on the same page and no one with their own personal agendas. Just released, the brand new Resurgence album came out October 22nd. This is Return of the Corpse Grinder. It's Massacre on the Nuclear Pod Blast. Oh, my God. 
all the latest releases, bundles, and pre-orders at NuclearBlastUSA.com. Subscribe to the free email newsletter and receive a 10% off coupon to the Nuclear Blast USA online store.
Andrew Sample back with the Nuclear Pod Blast, and a uh, big pleasure to have Stefan Kumara from Obscura, vocalist, guitarist, via Skype. Thank you so much, Stefan, for taking the time for, uh, for the Nuclear Blast podcast family. Hi there, lovely to be there, or ooh, as some Swiss guy said some years ago. Ooh, we know that very well. <laughs> so uh, this is your sixth album, A Valediction, coming out not for a little while, November of uh, November 19th, your sixth album of crazy technical death metal, but your first for Nuclear Blast. Um, so how does it feel to have a new home after so many years? Well, we just well closed a big and very long chapter that uh, has been following the band for around 10 years. So we uh, recorded and wrote four albums that have been connected to each other. And this entire chapter was simply closed. We finished what we once started such a long time ago. And when we thought about uh, a restart, a blank page in front of us, we uh, also had to look for, well, a new partner. And uh, while the old contract was simply fulfilled, we got a lot of offers and I choose the record label. I felt that was simply the best for the band where I can work on a very long time. And don't get me wrong, we got offers with uh, bigger budgets, but we choose what we felt was exactly what this band needed to. Well, Obscura is no stranger to concepts and connecting different songs and albums, as you just said, through music and lyrics, uh, with the previous album, Deluvium, completing that four-album uh, tetralogy, if you will. As a massive and forward-stepping album as that is, and I believe it was the first to actually register on the German album charts, you've approached the new album, uh, it seems to be, in a different way. A Valediction was written and recorded, of course, during the pandemic, um, so please enlighten us with maybe the different approach you had to this album. Well, why well, um, the previous album and actually all albums have been pretty much, well, I wouldn't call them polished, but uh, thought through a lot. As you also mentioned, all those uh, concepts we worked on, I felt a little bit not guided, but more like uh, trapped, to be honest. And with the new one, we thought about how we can combine what this band its origin is the decor of the band, the, or the original sound, the signature music we basically keep always brought to the table and uh, make it a little bit more ready for live shows. So the entire album was written similar to the previous albums, but uh, the intention was different. So we are a metal band and first of all, we are a death metal band and therefore we play live shows for our fans. I'm not going on stage to play for myself, but for everybody who's coming up to the concert, because without fans, there wouldn't be a show. I mean, that's crystal clear. And therefore, we thought about how we can translate our musical vision towards a, a more entertaining live performance. And therefore, the main aim or difference towards all the other albums we had released in the, in the year, last years was simply the fact that it should be a little bit more digestible. Don't get me wrong, it's not easier. We are definitely not playing three chord punk rock. That's yeah. clear, <laughs> crystal clear. <laughs> but um, it's a little bit more easy to get and um, not that abstract. It has more personal content. It's basically a band that's making music together for the sake of making music together. It's more a fun approach and I'm very sure you can hear and recognize the, the joy and excitement you had uh, writing, recording, and producing those 11 songs on the record. It's crazy good. I've had such a, a fantastic time listening to it over the last few days. Now, you've got a new drummer in the band, and A Valediction sees the return of Christian on guitar and uh, Yaron on bass. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. How did this sort of old and new lineup come together for this new album? Well, it was quite a, a short task because it took me less than two weeks to assemble a new lineup for the band. <laughs> I had a, a clear vision where to go after Diluvium dropped uh, in 2018. And uh, Jeroen, Christian and David have been the first persons I reached out to. And since Jeroen and Chris and myself worked together in the past, it was quite easy because we already know each other. We wrote music together in the past, so it was quite easy to uh, uh, get this done also with the, with the new material. And David is an absolute uh, professional drummer. He's located in Austria, and he has quite a history of delivering a lot of extreme drum performances for many, many years. 
if you follow him or just uh, look him up on, uh, pro for example, his YouTube channel, he's delivering for more than 10 years extreme music. And also his uh, personal music taste fits pretty much to ours. And he was supposed to be a, a substitute for a certain very important festival in Germany where we wanted to play, but in the end couldn't take the offer. So uh, we have been in touch for quite a while. And long story short, it was super easy to uh, to convince them to join the band. Basically, it was just an email and a call. And uh, we immediately started working on the records, sharing ideas and... It was quite easy putting this album together. He sounds like he fits perfectly in there. So uh, the first single and video for Devoured Usurper has already received an amazing response in just a couple of days with only with over 50,000 YouTube views. Such a great song to kick off the album. And I have to say that tempo change at two minutes and 40 seconds in is pretty killer, man. <laughs> That's pretty much the opposite of everything we did in the past. <laughs> uh, since uh, Devout Your Serpa is one of the songs that definitely stands out from the entire album, we wanted to take this song in particular uh, and choose it for one of the, the four singles we are going to, to release before the album drops. This song could, well, please everyone who is into obituary bloodbath and uh, real old school death metal like Morbid Angel in their early days. Yes. And this is, this is also an influence we always had in our music. In, on all the, the five previous albums, we have songs similar to that. But here we really got nuts and worked for the very, very first time with a deep beat. That's the part you mentioned. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. And it just it's seamless, too. It's just It perfectly fits right in there. But it starts before you realize the change. It's that seamless. <laughs> well, working with uh, famed producer Frederick Nordstrom must have been a rewarding experience. What, has, or what was he able to bring to the band's sound or production, possibly, that other producers weren't able to in the past? Well, working with Frederick was definitely an experience. First of all, he's, he's quite a character but a very funny one. And uh, it was a pleasure working with him on the on the record. And his approach is a little bit different to what we did in the past. In the past, we probably got lost a little bit in uh, working on details. His idea and his intention is more about looking at, especially hearing the entire picture and the entire song. So he's pretty much song related. He calls himself uh, being rooted in the pop scene. So especially unfolding melodies within songs is uh, one of his strengths, focusing on vocal lines, stuff like this. And that's pretty much different to what we did in the past. Also, his way of mixing and working is less polished. The entire album has quite a, quite a raw approach. Uh -huh. But do, do, don't get me wrong, it's, you, you will not find any mistake or any wrong played note on the entire record, but it feels not like... Uh, like an entirely polished and edited to death and boring sounding album. It's extremely organic. It's, it sounds like a band is playing, like real humans. And this, this human touch is something I really wanted to, to establish a little bit more. And he's quite famous for that. He made productions in the mid 90s. Probably everyone, everyone has at home, like In Flames, At The Gates, The Muborgia, Arch Enemy. But also his recent work, especially for Architects, a uh, British band, is stellar, simply stellar. And each band got his, uh, his touch, but still kept the, the very original, uh, original sound. And this is something not every producer can do these days, in my opinion. Sometimes you, you just enter a studio and it's more or less the same settings as the previous band had. Uh, especially if you work with sound replacements all over the place. But here it's different. It's definitely, well, unfolding or, or uh, getting to the essence of what each band is developing and uh, putting on the table. And that's definitely, definitely a cool thing. And I hear the band made a big, big step forward. The entire album sounds more white, more broad and deep. It's almost three dimensional very cohesive i think the production is stellar and you're right it, it could be the all, all the members stay, uh, playing in one room you know it's it's that cohesive so 
Well, we talked about Devoured Usurper already, how different that is from, you know, songs in the past, but also um, When Stars Collide, another standout track with the varying tempos and different vocal styles. Uh, the solo section is pretty catchy as, and progressive as well, and adding in uh, Bjorn Strid's clean vocals to the chorus really makes the song shine, so another standout track there. Well, Bjorn Strid is one of the most underrated singers in the metal scene, in my opinion, and I'm personally a big fan of uh, his, his bands. He's present on the record because uh, when we recorded the vocal lines and uh, listened to the pre-production I did, and I mentioned to uh, Frederick, like, hey, in this part, I would like to do something, well, in the in what Soilwork would do. Like, hey, you understand what I mean? And he just said, oh, well, then let's call Bjorn because I recorded probably 10 albums with him. <laughs> <laughs> so and within three days, we had uh, him like recording uh, his own vocals, have it on the mix and done. It was super spontaneous. And I'm very, very proud to have Bjorn Street on the record. It's really great. The new release bio from Nuclear Blast states that lyrically, a valediction is layered in structure and meaning. Um, but I want you to elaborate on that and tell us a little bit uh, about the lyrics either as a whole or maybe a couple of individual songs. Um, in the past, we worked with uh, very stiff concepts, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to, to break out of this a little bit. So um, the new album, A Valediction, is part of a three-album trilogy, but it's not that hard-guided as uh, the previous records. So okay. uh, long story short, I have one main topic or let's call it a headline and each song tells uh, quite an individual story but that somehow deals with that to get a little bit more in in depth a valediction is quite clear it uh, it's more or less uh, a farewell to say goodbye to something mm -hmm. and literally translated i lost a couple of friends musicians i, I shared the stage with uh, family members all during the last two and three years and i somehow had to deal and uh, well Think about that. It's a certain certain reflection. Okay. For example, the, the last song "Heritage" was written the same week Sean Reinhardt passed away, and I have some history with him because we played together in Death to All. He was supposed to be a drummer on our second album, Cosmogenesis. Mm -hmm. Then uh, Alexi Laio passed away. Sean uh, Jean Malone passed away, and uh, just to name a few, the bassist of my other band passed away. And somehow this all let me think about. Also, what I'm doing because my my days are counted as well. I just don't know when it's over. So, hmm. well, the vocals have a variety of range. We've already talked about uh, in delivery throughout the record. Uh, as the title track, a valediction offers more of the higher pitched, shrieking style vocals on it. Whereas, again, Devoured Usurper has that lower end sort of um, classic, you know, maybe Immolation, Morbid Angels style to it. Was this a conscious effort to bring a wider vocal range to this album? or something that um, you feel like each song just sort of dictates its own vocal? Um, I think it's a mixture out of experiencing or experience of the, the, all the productions I did in the past. On the other hand, a song like Devout Your Serpa with the sludgy riffs, well, it asks more or less for sure, yeah. what it is now. So, um, But I also try to experiment a little bit and... Uh, we always worked since probably 12, 13 years, roughly uh, since a decade with vocoders. And I also brought them up, but in a little less prominent way. They're not that uh, straight in your face. They're more used like like uh, slight choirs somewhere in the background. I'm always uh, trying to, uh, to deepen up with uh, dynamics. So the acoustic guitar and those choirs and those tiny little little extra layers somewhere in the background you hear best when you listen through headphones that are some ways to, to well, make give the album a little, little bit deeper approach and widen the mix. And this is something I always try to do with the vocals as well. Because if you if you have a singer that is, is just screaming in the same rage for probably an hour, it's kind of tiring. Also for myself. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time for the Nuclear Pod Blast, the new Obscura record, A Valediction, out November 19th worldwide. Your first with Nuclear Blast. Uh, congratulations on the new record. Hey, thank you very much for the invitation. And, well, you bet. see you then next year in North America. You bet, Stefan. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. All right, cheers. Goodbye. Wait!
What a great track, When Stars Collide, from the album A Valediction from Obscura, coming out November 19th. And that was a great pleasure to talk to Stefan from the band. Never had a chance to interview him before. Obviously super talented and uh, just killer. Getting to the end of this episode of the Nuclear Pod Blast, I'm Andrew Sample. Thanks again for listening. After the superb success of the first two albums, their debut Berserker in 2017, and its follow-up From Hell With Love in 2019, Beast in Black have a new album out called Dark Connections. We'll finish this episode of the Pod Blast with a track from that album, but first, after nearly two and a half decades of death metal dominance, with nine cataclysmic albums in their arsenal, Norway's veteran Annihilator's Blood Red Throne have officially joined the roster of Nuclear Blast. Daniel Olison from the band says, Blood Red Throne still delivers quality death metal, but even after writing the first song, we felt that we were onto something new this time. Of course, it's still death metal, but some of the riffs and arrangements introduce something new for us at least. Ten badass tracks wrapped in a killer production, we really can't wait to show our old fans as well as gaining new ones. Here's a track from that new album, Imperial Congregation, came out back on October 8th. This is Blood Red Throne with Transparent Existence. And this is Andrew once again, and thanks for listening to the Nuclear Pod Blast.
This is the Nuclear Pod Blast, the official podcast for Nuclear Blast Records. <laughs> 